All right, here we have um, a non-native plant. It's not super noxious, but it is common along trails and roadsides. It likes disturbance. This is um, f fennel, uh, phoni phoniculum vulgare. Um, if you break this and smell it, you will get a licorice, definite li licorice smell to it. It is edible. Um, and so the seeds off of here will be licorice seeds, you know, like you get at an Indian restaurant after you've eaten to settle your stomach. Um, but you can see these stalks are from last year's growth. And um, what color are the flowers? Flowers are yellow, bright yellow. Um, and here we just have a clump of a bunch of them. And then they've got these highly divided leaves you know, almost looks a little bit like a horsetail. Um, but it is a roadside weed that you will see. Here we have Artemisia californica, California sagebrush. Um, you see it's got those flexible stems to it, woody growth underneath. Um, definitely a perennial shrub. Um, this is a nice thick stand of it here, thicker than we've seen before. Really drought tolerant plant for California landscapes. Here we have a wild mustard. These were seeded to mark the route of the El Camino Real between the mustards by the Spaniards when they colonized California. Um, it is now widespread in grasslands across the state. Um, they have basal deeply lobed leaves, um, four petals with yellow flowers. These are just in bud. They do not have flowers yet. There's a bud right there. Um, this is likely Bra Brassica nigra, black mustard. But there's also field mustard, um, Mediterranean mustard. There's like half a dozen varieties. Um, they are all related to species like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, kohlrabi. Um, so you'll recognize the scent if you break the, the stems off. You'll recognize that collard green, the, I mean cauliflower, um, breath a Brussels sprout scent to it. Um, so this is a thick patch here, very common in disturbed areas next to roads, trails, um, and a California weed across the state. Here we have a beautiful Bacchus pilularis coyote brush. You'll notice it doesn't have any buds or seed at the top here. That will happen in the fall. Um, that it will set seed. Um, this has really woody undergrowth and um, it does like disturbance, roadsides, trail sides, um, areas that have been grazed, it will colonize um, afterwards. Baccarus pilularis. And then over across the trail here, we have poison hemlock. I am not going to touch it, but I'll stand in front of it here. This has very finely divided um, compound leaves. Um, it's a member of the carrot or the APACA family. It's originally from Europe and it's widespread now along roadsides and urban areas. Um, white flowers are produced in an umbel um, shaped cluster in the spring and early summer. This is a highly toxic plant implicated in deaths, the most famous of which is the poisoning of the Greek philosopher Socrates. Consuming a small portion of this plant can cause fatal poisoning, numbing, convulsions, paralysis, accidental poisoning still occur from plants in the carrot family. Um, the maroon spots are something that's unique here along the stem. 
Um, conium comes from the Greek name for the word poison, and maculatum means spotted. spotted. So this is a, a weed. So here we have the poison hemlock in flower. You can see the spotted purple stem that's characteristic of it. <clears throat> and then as you work your way up the stem, we can see these compound umbels that um, have these delicate white petals and then the seed forming here um, as this plant develops and matures. So we just wanted to give you this to help with the ID. Here we have an uh, invasive thistle. This is Italian thistle. This one has pretty small little flowers at the top. Um, and the foliage is very white underneath the leaves. And it's very spiky all the way up. Um, the family, the plants in the Asteraceae family have a lot of invasive thistles across the state. The, um, uh, has, they usually have disc flowers, so it's in the aster, but it has these smaller upright disc flowers instead of those wide ray flowers with the petal, bigger petal associated. Um, they're native to Europe and the Mediterranean, but with Spanish colonization, they were introduced to the state. They're very common along roadsides, in pastures and agricultural fields. California has 20 species of native thistles, several of which are endangered, but here is pictured some invasive thistles across the state. Yellow star thistle is one of the worst. Woolly distaff thistle is a little bit larger in size. Here's the Italian thistle we just have seen. Tocolote has red coloration to it. Milk thistle, Cicimbrium marinum, bull thistle, and purple star thistle is closely related to yellow star thistle here. All right. Here we have Sedalsia malviflora. It's a checker mallow. It's in the Malvaceae family. So the leaves, so you can tell here the leaves start um, like this, and then as you move up the stem, they become more and more um, divided. It almost looks like a lupin leaf here at the top. The stems are very glandular, and they're reddish green. Um, and um, alternate leaf. Um, and we've got the five sepals underneath the five petals. Um, it's just a really gorgeous wildflower here. And next to this um, little patch, we have a patch of Cicerincum vellum, blue-eyed grass, which we saw last week. <clears throat> Sometimes it's called the yellow-eyed iris. It's a perennial herb that grows in moist grassy sites throughout California. <clears throat> Although called a grass due to its appearance, it's a member of the iris family, Iridaceae. It has folded basal leaves. <clears throat> the six-parted deep bluish purple flower appears April to June. And the contrasting colors of the yellow and purple attracts pollinators. Spanish settlers made tea from its roots. <clears throat> and a third century student of Aristotle first gave it the name Cisrincium to describe that it was Irish, iris like. Um, bellum means pretty, like Bella. And you can see here we have an albino version of this. Sometimes you'll see a blade of grass that is white. Sometimes people have albino characteristics. This is an example of uh, the genetics of the Cisrinchium mutating a little bit to create these white albino 
flowers, which still have the same morphological characteristics. It looks like the um, it's got the same six petals, reproductive parts, everything else is the same. What I am holding here is an inflorescence of purple needle grass. You can see how it gets its name. It has these purplish red um, flowers with very long awns. So the awns are needle-like and the awn is an attachment to the seed. So I can pull out an individual seeds here and you can see how that awn comes with the seed. They're developed this way so that they will attach to animals, um, fur, and transport. So Cicerinchium is a perennial bunch grass. If you yank on it, it's pretty sturdy. Um, stipa. Oh, sorry, stipa pulchra. Um, after years of drought and overgrazing and fire suppression, it has reduced its abundance in California grassland. Um, it's dominant in the foothills surrounding the Central Valley. It has one to three foot tall flowering stems with purplish brown spikelets and a drooping inflorescence. Purple needle grass is the official California state grass and stipa is from the Greek word stupion meaning fiber um, referring to the fibrous ons and pulchra means beautiful so you can see how some of last year's growth is still in this um, bunch at the bottom here where the the grass blades are white or brown so that is also evidence that it is a perennial grass here we have Athena or wild oats. It's in the Poaceae, the grass family. It is super common in grasslands throughout California and one of the worst weeds in the world. It has aggressively outcompeted California native grasses. Um, two widespread oat species in California are Avena fatua and Avena barbata. Um, I think we definitely have both at this site, but these I believe are Avena barbata. You can tell because of the very long awns. So each grass has two papery parts on the bottom and top. That is the palea and the lemma. These distinguish the grass and I'm opening the flower here. And you can have different number of seeds inside the paleon lemma. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. So here I think we have two seeds. Each one is distinguished by an on nearby. And these aren't fully developed, but there's one in here, one in here, and you can see the hairs kind of forming at the base of the seed. But grasses, you often need a microscope to diagnose what species it is. Um, that makes life a lot easier. Also with, with sedges, carexes, it's good to have a microscope as a tool. Um, but wild oats have dominated California grassland and changed the ecosystem function as a whole. So it's an important species to recognize. <clears throat> Tell me when you're... This is lizard tail, Areophyllum stachydifolium, or golden woolly yarrow. It has um, more gray foliage than the golden yarrow we saw last week. It also occurs in more coastal habitats. It's a subshrub from coastal scrub, edges of beaches, and stabilized dunes never meet reaching more than a few miles inland. The fragrant leaves are deeply divided, nearly hairless on top with a woolly underside. Look at how woolly that underside is, how woolly white. <clears throat> Starting in April, 
It produces these bright yellow inflorescences composed of minute ray and disc flowers. If I pull one of these off, you'll notice it's got about 10 ray flowers around the edge there. <clears throat> the Northern California Coastal Miwok people ground lizard tail seeds into mush and plates post it on skin to relieve pain. This is an easy to grow plant and it's popular in coastal gardens with the contrast between its blooms and its foliage. It's just beautiful. Stinky defolium is a Greek word for lavender. <clears throat> and you can see on this map here, it just occurs along a sliver a few miles along the coast of California. In this spot along the trail, you can notice how the black mustard and the avena, the oats, are invasive. What happens is they'll create a monoculture or a patch where they are the only species present. That's a common behavior of non-native invasive species. Here we have a species that should be recognizable to you by now, sticky monkey flower. <clears throat> These leaves are a little bit dried out from the sun, so they're not as sticky, but the farther I get down on the plant, they are. It's got the bilateral symmetry on the flowers. <clears throat> Tubular um, design to the flowers. And it's a shrub to about three to five feet. Very drought tolerant for your garden and so many varieties of monkey flower that are commercially available. Reds, pinks, yellows, um, all different colors. So here we have sticky monkey flower. Here we have Verbena laziostachys. You can see it flowers from the bottom to the top. Um, it has opposite leaves very hairy and it has a square or an angled stem. Um, there's purplish coloration all along the stem in the leaves and uh, this is a ground cover that occurs from uh, all along coastal California. Um, there are garden verbenas that are excellent ground covers. They're a little bit more water requiring on some other alternatives um, but uh, this is a native that actually is new to me um, that we'll put on your species list for this week. Here we have Pseudonephalium species. These <clears throat> plants in this genus have uh, alternate leaves you can see how there's small flowers forming at the nodes in these leaves, but it usually will have a more conspicuous inflorescence at the top. There are a hundred species in um, the pearly everlasting genus Pseudonephalium. They are distributed throughout the world with 12 species native and introduced in California. They grow in different habitats from coastal scrub to chaparral to dry wooded hills to grasslands to stabilized dunes and coastal bluffs. They are in the sunflower family with disc flowers. They are short-lived perennials. Um, the small heads are surrounded by conspicuous paper-like fillories. which can be a range of colors and that's how that persists for a while and that's why they have the common name everlasting. <clears throat> the leaves can be sticky and smell like maple syrup. <clears throat> the Greek name nephalon means a lock of wool and refers to the wooliness of this species. This one here is pretty green but sometimes you'll notice more of a gray, woolly color to this genus. 
Here we have golden yarrow, which we saw on the Reservoir Canyon hike last week. This is related to the lizard tail that we just saw, and it is mixed into this Artemisia California sagebrush. You'll see it kind of circles around here. It's a small gray-green subshrub from California to Baja, California. <clears throat> and the common name is derived from the resemblance of its floral heads to those of your true yarrow, Achillea millifolium. And Areophyllum means woolly in Greek. But it does have just this beautiful bright red. And we can see here how the buds form into um, half a sphere before flowering. Here we have a plant called sneezeweed. This species, particularly, the petals are very minute and folded back. You can see them at the base, along the base here. Um, this is Helenium puberulum. It's in the Asteraceae family. The leaves definitely are clasping the stem. You'll even see this leaf blade growing along the stem here. Very unique characteristic to this species. <clears throat> this occurs in wetlands and grasslands across the state. And there are other um, Hellenium or sneezeweed um, varieties that occur in the mountains and the foothills. Um, but this is a coastal variety of sneezeweed. See how thick the leaf foliage is here? This one has liked the recent rains. Okay. Here we have Yerba Buena, Clinopodium uh, species. It's got the opposite leaves. It has the square stem and this is an herb you can use in tea and it's a common ground cover species. Here we have a wetter patch in this hillside, maybe a seep in the coastal scrub. So we've got some shrubs that that moisture is supporting. California coffee berry, Frangula californica. Notice how bright green the new foliage is compared to the darker green foliage below and the purple red stems. And then back behind us here, this big tree is a wax myrtle, Morella californica. We saw that in the Arboretum hike. <clears throat> you can see some birds are sheltering underneath it. Here. And in front of me, there's a patch of the monkey flower and stakies. Bulata. Um, notice how bright purple the inflorescences is, are at the top here. This is a happy patch. Here we have California buckwheat. It occurs from central California down to southern California and northwestern Mexico. The Ariogonum is a genus of 250 species. 125 of those species are native to California. They occur in chaparral, coastal scrub, deserts, canyons, and washes. This shrub shares a specific epithet with chemise due to its bundled leaves. The, the evergreen leaves have margins that roll under and it has these woolly undersides. So you see that, how the leaves kind of have a lip that rolls there? <clears throat> um, no part of this plant is edible, but the flowers are excellent source of nectar for butterflies and honeybees. The roots and floral heads were dried by Native Americans to treat ailments. <clears throat> Areogonum means woolly, knees in Greek, referring to the hairy nodes of the first species named in this genus. <clears throat> and we are transitioning from coastal scrub um, to grassland, you can see in the distance here. 
Here we have Salvia mellifera or black sage. You've seen this before. It is California's most common sage. It's a, it's a component of coastal scrub and chaparral. This is drought deciduous, so it loses its leaves during the summer. It produces white to lavender clusters. It's an important nectar for native bees. And a tea can be made from the leaves that's used as an antiseptic mouthwash and general disinfectant. These leaves have such a strong odor, it's overwhelming just standing right next to this guy. You'll notice how glandular the leaves are. That's something that's um, common in aromatic or strong smelling plants. And you'll also notice the bilateral symmetry on these flowers that are stacked in whorls beautiful plant. Here we have a large native ryegrass. It's as tall as I am <clears throat> that um, we saw in the Cal Poly Arboretum. So this is a repeat from previous weeks. You'll no notice the clasping auricle here where the leaf blade clasps the, the stem at the node. Um, and you'll notice these blades that have um, dried out. Um, the Elemis is a specific tribe of grasses, and I can't remember off the top of my head which species this is, but we'll put it on your list. Here we have a grass known as rye grass. It's a non-native. Festuca perennis. It's in the Poaceae, the grass family. You can see here, this is dried pollen that's hanging, or these loose pieces here. Ryegrass was brought to California when the first European settlers brought livestock hay, and it's become a noxious naturalized component of California grassland. It's spread through the, throughout the entire U.S., growing in dry to moist abandoned fields, meadows, and disturbed sites. It can be distinguished from most other in this genus by the spike-like unbranched inflorescence. And the arrangement of the spikes into two ranks across this flattened plain here. <clears throat> Pollen from ryegrass causes a lot of hay fever and allergies. Festuca means straw in Latin and perennis comes from the fact that some of these are perennial, though in California grassland, these plants are usually annual. So we have a big swath of it on either side of the trail here. And this is uh, highly palatable to livestock species. So for those people, I'm being very careful, but that is our rattlesnake. Very slow, see the rattle? I am not. Lindsay didn't want me coming this close. That looks very snake-like. Here you can see the Morro Bay Estuary in the distance, Los Osos off to the left. This is where the salt water meets the fresh water of uh, Los Osos and Choro Creek. And you can see the sand spit in the distance that's holding the bay in place. <clears throat> that's protecting this ecosystem from sea level rise. And this is a nice spot to um, rent a kayak from Los Osos or Morro Bay and explore the estuary. Here we have a soap plant, Chlorogalum parmigiatum, in the Agavaceae family, with its waxy blue green leaves that have these undulating edges to it. We saw this last week um, in Reservoir Canyon. Native Americans had many uses for this species, and it has a star shaped white flower. And then, if we go down the trail a little ways, this is a Castilea species closely related to 
um, Indian paintbrush, but it's called Owl's Clover. It's in the Orobanchiaceae, um, and it's got parasitic roots, so it lives off of nutrients from other plants. Um, each spike-like inflorescence contains inconspicuous tubular flowers and um, subtended by a colorful calyx. Um, sometimes the puffy tip of the flowers resembles the face of an owl, hence the name Owl's Clover. Here we have Silene Laciniana, Indian Pink, <clears throat> and Silene species usually have really sticky foliage, so this is sticking to my hand here, so you see me as I pull it back, and then the way that the buds emerge from this tubular capsule and have the sepals that are fused into that tube is a unique characteristic. <clears throat> you can see the stamens emerging from this highly di divided petal structure. And we have opposite leaves across the stem. This is an uncommon wildflower found in grasslands, coastal scrub, chaparral. <clears throat> and there's a little bit of a purplish hue. The reason for the stickiness is it's a Glange, glandular. So there are dotted glands all the way up the stems and the leaves here. Susan spotted this, so thank you, Susan. Here we have Rosa Californica hiding under the shade of a coyote brush and Artemisia here. You can see the serrated leaflets, the very thorny, red thorny stem how the new foliage has a brighter yellow-green color to it, and this will have very delicate five-petaled pale pink flowers. Very fragrant. In the summer, beautiful fragrance on them. This can be used in your garden like other rose species and does well as an understory in partial shade. Here, if you remember from week one, we have Diclostemma capitatum. This one is in a little bit more flower than what we saw before. <clears throat> it's got six fused petals. Um, it looks like the sepals are petals in this case. <clears throat> and it's coming from a perennial bulb. Um, here are the leaves on it. This occurs in a wide variety of coastal habitats, from sage scrub to dunes to chaparral. <clears throat> and it's been infrequent on our hike today. Dark. Here we have a gorgeous flower known as California buttercup, Ranunculus californicus in the Ranunculaceae or buttercup family. There are over 600 species native to the temperate world. Many of them are cultivated. Um, all contain uh, poison. In California, there are 23 natives and six weedy species. <clears throat> the most widespread is this species, California buttercup. Shiny yellow petals are born on branched inflorescence that arise from a rosette of deeply divided leaves. <clears throat> I'm not seeing the rosette here. Further back. Look at in there. there oh, here we go. There. There's the divided leaves. <clears throat> um, after pollination, the pistils at the center of the flower develop into hooked fruits. <clears throat> um, ranunculus means little frog. Here are those hooked fruits. These will grab onto animals and attach for a ride to be dispersed. Ranunculus means little frog or rana, and it's derived from the possibility that this species shares habitat with frogs. It's common in seeps, the edges of grasslands, next to riparian corridors, areas with higher water availability. Here we have a Tridilea species. It's got six petals, six stamen, <clears throat> very symmetrical. 
And look at the lines, the green lines up the back of these petals. That's kind of cool. <clears throat> uh, it is related to asparagus. It's in the asparagus family. And it has these thicker blades as leaves that is starting to dry out here. It's in this grassland field with some <clears throat> melica and rye grass, some purple needle grass, which we looked at before, and Cisrinchium bellum here. So it's a beautiful little wild flower patch. There's some buds over there of the Tritillaea and some ranunculus. Here we have a loco weed, astragalus. You can see the flowers here. <clears throat> it's in the, the Fabaceae or the pea family. So it does have that banner and keel to the flower and wings. These are a little dried out to see that. It has pinnately compound leaflets. And then it has these really funky seeds that you can pop. Oh, like that. Um, loco weeds are a large genus, 2,000 species worldwide, 100 in California, occur in a variety of plant communities. They can be annual or perennial. They can be hairy or not. <clears throat> the seeds of some species rattle inside inflated fruit. They are toxic um, and accumulate selenium from the soil. Um, because of their effect on domestic animals, the Spanish word loco became a part of their name. And astragalus <clears throat> is Greek for ankle bone. And um, they are often a ground cover like this photo here. So they'll have this <clears throat> ground cover habitat habit to them. Um, but this one here, the Moro loco weed, is upright. Here we have Ribes speciosum, fuchsia flowered gooseberry. We get that in the sun. There we go. There it shows off. Okay. <clears throat> you can see how the stamen and the style are protruding from the urn shaped bright red pink flower. It has. Um, these leaflets with three kind of lobes on them and this reddish coloration. The leaves are tight all the way up the stem and it does have thorns all along the stem. This is a favorite of um, pollinators and it's a nice attractive species for your yard. Here is the seed of the Mara Fabaceae manroot. And look at how large that is. If you see the size of my palm, it's like half of my hand size and very spiky. What we were noticing is this Toyon, Heteromeles arbutifolia behind us here is starting to flower. You'll notice some of the leaves are turning red. That is common, but it will burst into white bloom shortly here. And this is a large specimen. It's about a 20 foot tree. 15 foot um, and it's a great attractor for wildlife species. Here we have the Areophyllum golden yarrow which we saw last week and this plant is in full bloom. You just missed a couple of butterflies. Oh here comes one. A couple of butterflies landing to grab the nectar. <clears throat> This is in a grassland dominated by ryegrass. And we've got some Cisrinchium bellum, some bluet grass, some Artemisia, Californica, Bacchus, Mimulus, or Diplocus arantiacus in the background here. This one right here we have chemise, Adenosina fasciculatum. We saw this in week one at Coon Creek. Here we are in Los Osos, not too far away. And this entire hillside is covered in chemise. Some of the patches are in full bloom. Others just have buds and then others don't have any buds yet. So it makes you wonder, you know, 
how does phenology work? It really has a lot to do with microsite conditions. How much moisture is in the soil, how much sun the plant is getting. And we see some toyon sprouting up on the right. Um, some oaks here popping up out of the chemise and some black sage. Here we have Terinium aquilinum, western bracken fern. It occurs across um, the western states. <clears throat> we don't have any spores forming on the back of the leaves yet, but we are an oak understory here. So we have poison oak, coffee berry, um, hedge nettle, um, and a wide diversity of species. Here in the distance, we have island bush poppy, dendromecan, either Hartford eye or rigida, occurs, one is inland and one is coastal. <clears throat> we'll just put spa for species on your list. Um, this has really silky, beautiful four petaled flowers that are bright yellow, and it has gray green foliage. We have a hummingbird here visiting us. Um, it has gray green foliage. It's very drought adapted. It does well in full sun in yards. It does well as a hedge <clears throat> or a screen. Um, what family is it in, Lindsay? It is in the Papaveraceae family. It's beautiful silky petals. Here we have the Dendromecan a little bit closer to the trail. You can see it gets quite large. 